Welcome back to Reviews with Elaine, because I have opinions. Today's opinions will be about Flora Segunda by Isabeau S. Wiles? Wills? I'm just going to assume I mispronounced every single bit of her name except for the S. So I almost put this book down before I'd even really started it because of one word. And I'm so glad that I didn't. Uh, so one of my biggest pet peeves about young adult or middle grade books is when the author cannot quite capture the voice of the age range she's writing about. Like books featuring 16 year olds that talk like 10 year olds or 10 year olds that talk like 7 year olds. I hate it. It really bothers me. I even prefer when the author like ages up their characters accidentally. So like when there are characters that are supposed to be 10 but they talk like they're 12 or 14 or 16. I'll tolerate that. But objectively, just getting the age range of the characters wrong really bothers me. And sometimes this is because the books are written for a younger audience than they're featuring. So like, yeah, the 12 year old character is talking like a seven year old, but that's because the books are aimed at seven year olds. But no, even in those cases, it still bothers me a good bit. And the first two chapters of this book, the main character, who is 13, supposed to be 14 in like four days, says the word potty like a dozen times. And I found it infuriating. Now, there are a lot of other linguistic oddities in the narration, but I found all of them acceptable. They felt like slang. They felt like something a 13-year-old in this world would say, especially when we saw more adult characters also saying some of these words. And a lot of it was just portmanteaus, combining words, adding suffixes, adding prefixes. And this all feels like the way 13-year-olds play with ling language. I'm okay with that. But potty? 13 going on 14 year olds do not say the word potty with a straight face. And I think the author sort of realizes this because for the majority of the book, the character refers to the bathroom as the loo, which is a much more age appropriate word. Uh, and by the way, this book is not written for the little ones. There is some gruesome stuff in the book. I think it says on the back it's age 12 and up and that feels about right. But to the actual book. Flora Segunda is the story of a girl named Flora, who is about to turn 14. Now, her 14th birthday is an important date in this culture, because uh, the day she turns 14 will be the day she will be presented to the warlord, the ruler of this kingdom, and asked to swear loyalty to the kingdom. Uh, and afterwards, she will be going off to the barracks, the school that will teach her to join the military. And everyone in her family joins the military. Uh, her family is very important. Her mother is actually the warlord's main general. But Flora's life is also a little bit miserable. Her giant beautiful house is falling down. Her mother is never home. Her father is a mad drunk who just has to be babysat all the time. And their magic butler was banished so long ago that she has no idea what it's like to live with somebody else doing the laundry, cooking, cleaning, and general chores. And Flora does not want to go to the barracks. She doesn't want to be a soldier. What she wants to be is a ranger, which is a mix of sort of like a spy and a mage all together. But rangers were banned before she was born, and soldiers are not allowed to do magic. But when Flora accidentally stumbles across their banished bolt butler, Valfor, trapped in the old library of the house, she finally sees a chance to gain herself a little freedom. All she has to do is feed him a bit of her anima, her will, basically, and he can help her. That is, if he doesn't make everything significantly worse. So the thing that really stands out about this book is the spectacular originality of the world and characters. This book exists in a world that is part Victorian, part military, part Mesoamerican influence. There are these Quetzal... Quetzal... Quetzals? Quetzals? Quetzal? Quetzal Quetzal? 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 There are these Quetzals, uh, which are half eagle, half person, but there's also magic butlers. The kingdom this is set in is in an uncomfortable peace with a kingdom that sounds pretty much like a uh, sort of if the Aztec Empire survived to Victorian era. Uh, they wear kilts and buy corn hats. The military wears white wigs, but also facial scarring. And the author knows exactly how much of the world to give us at any given time. 
a lot of books with unusual worlds drops too much about it at the beginning, either with open exposition dumps or just by dropping us into a scene where a lot of stuff is going on that we will only understand once we've read the rest of the book. There's a Tanya Huff book that's like this. Uh, it starts right before a battle, and there are just so many undefined terms and character names in the first chapter that when I first read it, I had no idea what was going on. And yeah, going back when I reread it, everything made sense and I understood exactly what she was talking about. But because she dumped too much at the beginning, I didn't have any landmarks to latch on to. This book, on the other hand, introduces the unfamiliar slowly, dropping one or two new concepts in each chapter, so that you only realize how unusual the world is when you're like halfway through the book. And it feels like a really complete world, even though I still have a lot of questions. I still want to know what happened in the last war. I want to know Poppy's backstory. I want to know how the warlord came to power. What exactly Valfour got banished for. But... None of this felt like it was lacking in the book. It just made me want to go read the next one. And I loved the characters. There's a scene near the end when one of the characters is insulting Flora and her family, and I felt myself getting viscerally mad, wanting to step in and defend them. And it's done the same way the world is. Things started really simply, seeming rel relatively flat and one-dimensional, and the author built up elements bit by bit by bit as we went along. Like, for example, Flora's mom seems like she's going to be such a cliché overbearing mother. But when we actually meet her, she's lovely and kind, even while being tough as stone. And it's not one of those books where you see the protagonist's parents and go, oh, so she was just misinterpreting things, the parents are nice, and she's a whiny brat. No, Flora is right. Her mother is overbearing, but it's just not all there is to her. Uh, same with Poppy. He seems like a simple one-dimensional problem, but then we get to see these beautiful flashes of the person inside of the problem. And on that note, this book does some really beautiful subtle work of touching on mental health. Uh, Poppy, as mentioned, at first seems to be a one-dimensional mad character, but the more we see of him, the more we see Flora trying to deal with a parent who cannot parent her. Flora's struggle to come to see Poppy as more than just a burden, to see him as more than just weak, to understand him as a person, and to really get to understand his mourning, is subtle. It's so subtle you sort of don't realize it's going on until you're, like, almost done with it. It sort of just happens to Flora across the book. And that's really cool. And also, uh, so spoilers here. Flora gives Balfour her anima, and that basically starts draining her will. And she's left with something that looks an awful lot like a deep, deep depressive fit. She can't convince herself to care about the fact that she might be dying. In fact, at one point, she devolves to the point that she's literally thinking that she hopes she disappears soon because all of her problems seem too big to handle. The solutions seem impossible. She even starts striking out at her best friend, Udo, who is desperately trying to help her. And even though the word depression is never spoken, it felt so familiar to me. And Flora's journey from that is learning to accept help, but also, most importantly, to just keep going. Uh, Flora's hero, a ranger named Nini Mo, uh, has a quote that Flora uses to inspire herself and that other people actually use to inspire Flora as well that goes, the only way out is through. And that's really apropos for getting through a depression fit. Sometimes it is just about keep going until you get to the other side. And so Flora's magical problem feels an awful lot like one that 13-year-old and 14-year-olds might face in the real world. And the solution is actually helpful. Uh, and here, by the way, is another book for the middle grade range that the characters are absolutely obsessed with their heroes. <laughs> and yeah, just like in A Little Taste of Poison, it's a little bit annoying, but it's totally accurate. 13 and 14-year-olds are obsessive. It's just that simple. 
But I also want to talk about Flora's best friend, Udo. Uh, Flora's best friend is absolutely fabulous. He's a fop. He loves wearing the most ridiculous fashionable clothing. But the author does not give in to the cliché of having him just be ultra-feminine. He is aggressive, he is strong, he does makeup, he takes care of his younger siblings, he idealizes a pirate. His parents are in a polyamorous relationship and he has a powerful relationship with Flora. Which is clearly loving, but is in absolutely no way sexualized. They climb in bed with each other, Flora takes a bath in front of him, she lands on top of him a couple of times, and she recognizes that he's handsome, but it never feels romantic or sexual. And while, yeah, I can ship them, they would make a cute couple, I also really love the fact that there is this sweet, serious friendship between a male and female character that is not romantic. Neither is pining for the other. Uh, there is absolutely no sexual tension that I can read at all. And that's sort of nice to see. And honestly, this is the rare occasion where if they do end up in a romantic relationship by the end of the series, I'm cool with that. And if they don't, I'm cool with that too. I also love the fact that Flora and Udo are both clearly in over their heads. Like, everything is well beyond them. But they actually do have a solid, impressive skill set. Flora can do some serious magic and comes up with legitimately good plans. Udo's disguises and acting actually do hold up under scrutiny. And I kept expecting them to fail, because, like, characters in this age range do fail a lot. But even though they did fail, it was not their skills fa failing them. Their failures were almost always due to a lack of knowledge of what was really going on. And I feel like that sets them up as heroes that we're going to watch grow into greatness. They just need to learn more about the world and they will be spectacular. Even though they aren't those amazing people yet, they're working on it. And they are still heroes even though they have not quite achieved that yet. They keep going even once they realize they are so in over their heads. They keep trying. But one more thing I really want to talk about with this book, and that's the fact that there is a difference in the morality in this world to ours that is really subtle as well. Uh, I'm pretty sure it's never directly said anywhere in this book that this world puts a higher emphasis on bravery and boldness than other virtues. But it's there. It's not just a character thing. It's not just like Flora's parents think that bravery and boldness are important. Though, yes, her family is specified as being a very high emphasis on the bravery thing. Uh, it's said that they never die in bed. But you can also see it in Udo. You can see it in the other minor characters. You can see it in the way the culture is set up. Everything from the fact that the warlord gambles in a seedy ice cream parlor uh, to almost everyone showing Flora and Udo significantly more respect when they just refuse to back down. These things sort of add up to create this subtle shift in morality that is the kind of thing you see between real cultures in the real world. It adds to the feeling that this world is completely new and original, but also completely full. Like, I 100% believe that the author can answer any question I have about this world. It is completely painted out. And I love that. It's really well done. I like this book enough, I've already ordered the sequel. So yeah, Flora Segunda, recommended by me.